itself is uh, living in the divine will itself is the best exorcism you can do. <laughs> yes. So <clears throat> it's, um, say, for example, you um, pray your rosary in the divine will. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the demons have already admitted, you know, just to hear the names of Jesus, Mary, Joseph and Louisa is, is exorcism in itself. They flee when they hear those names because these names um, contain within themselves the fullness of the power of that person. So instead of learning all these exorcism prayers, which is something we did in the, in the sanctity of the virtues. I think the average Catholic would do the rosary, you know, as the mass, of course, number one, <laughs> you know, the greatest exorcism prayer you can do, the rosary. All the prayers the church have, has taught us. And did you know that the priest, the blessing of the priest is the highest sacramental in the church? Not many people know that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> certain priests today don't know that. I've spoken to them. They don't know that their blessing is the highest sacramental in the church. It's the blessing of Christ. So on Sunday, I was able to receive the you know, the first blessing of a newly ordained priest. Oh. So, so while I was in the church and watching all the people go up to receive this blessing, I fused all of humanity into that blessing so that each person from Adam to the last could receive this first blessing of that priest and of all newly ordained priests. So this in itself is an exorcism. You see, so every fusion of our acts that we do in the divine will, especially acts like that, are exorcising the world of the demonic influence. So <clears throat> we're engaged in a continual exorcism of the demonic from this world that's why jesus says we we are the most privileged and the most loved by him because he we're allowing him to live in us in order to exorcise the world of the demonic influence awesome yeah amen amen beautiful so don't don't worry about learning all <clears throat> you know a whole host of prayers i mean people don't get this it's really hard for me to convince them but this fusion of ourself into the divine will is the key that's why I, last uh, tuesday i read that quote in the beginning of um I haven't got my paper here. I have to go and get it. Um, you know, the paper I did? Yes. That fusing is the most important. Yes. Oh, you froze. On the earth. Oh. You see? Yes. So you go talking while I go find my paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go and find my paper. Thank you, my But friend. this... Uh, <clears throat> Um, I was talking to uh, uh, on uh, Saturday a few of my group because they're starting to, um, when they meet each other, you know, they'll say things, are you fused yet? <laughs> or um, uh, go and get fused or something like that. <laughs> anyway, we were joking about, you know, how people put stickers on car on their cars and we were trying to figure out what kind of a sticker we could put 
on, on the car that would confuse most people. Are you confused or confused? <laughs> no one will no one will understand what we're talking about. <laughs> Good. So Geraldine's just getting her paper. It's great to see you all. I'm going to get Geraldine to open up when she gets back with the prayer and then we'll get started. So I do love her prayers. Using is better. I beg your pardon, Thomas? Using is better than confusing. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got a little sticker on my car that says, pray, hope, and don't worry. So <laughs> that would be another one to put in, but only the divine willers would know what that means. <laughs> I'd be real special. Yes. Good to see you all. Oh, I'm going to see if I can do the other screen. Wow, that's great. I, excuse me, it's Linda from Canada. I just was thinking about those stickers. I think that would be an awesome uh, conversation opener. I, Somebody might ask you, what's that about? What a great <laughs> idea. Because sometimes you need something like that just to get what they mean, confusing, yeah. of confusion. I love it, Linda. Lovely to see you, or lovely to hear you, Linda. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Work. I love all your work. It's gorgeous. Thank you. So for people that... Oh, that's... <clears throat> is that the Linda that yes. sent the information from the City of God on the yes. two yes. assumptions? Yes, that's, that's the Linda. Oh, you hello, Linda. Linda. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for that because I I added it to my book and um, the book because they've, uh, and I spoke about that on Saturday. So thank you for uh, getting that information. <clears throat> Wonderful how we can work as a team in the family. Everyone's got their bit to contribute, and I love it. Thank you. So what's that little bit? Yes, I love it. Do you like it. to open up with the prayer first, but, um, uh, Geraldine, please? Yes. Oh, most eternal and divine trinity, we adore you. May our intellect, O oh Jesus, be filled with your wisdom. May our memories... O oh, Holy Spirit, be filled with your love. May our wills, O oh, Eternal Father, be filled with your will and its power. Je <coughs> Jesus, excuse me. <coughs> Jesus, life of my soul, beat of my heart, love of my life. As we read these lessons within which is a new heaven, a new creation, a new divine life of your beauty and your bountiful self, we pray to you to fuse yourself into us that we may become the wisdom of God to receive in our minds all the truths you want us to embrace that we may become the divine love with which to embrace them and that we may become the divine sorrow to grieve over all the refusals of these sublime truths. Open my mind and heart and the very depths of my soul that I may be consumed with your own ardours of love to receive all possible goods of our Heavenly Father's will, that not only I, but all may come to know him in and through you, dear Jesus, in the love of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Geraldine. That was beautiful. Now, would you like to do that? Uh, bit on fusion, sweetheart, and then we'll get into the paper. So welcome, everybody. It's a bit of a late welcome, but welcome, everybody. It's good to see you all. 
Um, would you like to do that little reading on fusion, Geraldine, please? <clears throat> Excuse me. Every time the soul fuses herself into the divine will, she fuses herself into the one single act of the Trinity in which all acts are contained. This is why Jesus says, my daughter, fusing yourself into my will is the most solemn, the greatest, the most important act of your whole life. Volume 17, January the 4th, 1925. Second quote. My daughter, every time the creature fuses herself into me, she gives the influence of the divine life to all creatures. Volume 12, May 16, 1917. And the third quote, by fusing herself into me, the soul repeats all that I did and continue to do. Volume 12, March 18, 1917. I'll just read that last one. It's so powerful. By fusing herself into me, the soul repeats all that I did and continue to do. Beautiful. It is powerful. That's awesome. Thank you, Geraldine. That was wonderful. I've written down those little things so I can chew on it. Now um, we'll get James to start reading. We're reading from, um, would you share the screen? Yep. We'll, well, then my poor soul continue to think. Yep. Thank you. Then my poor mind continued to think about the difference that exists between one who lets herself be dominated by the supreme will and one who lets herself be dominated by the human will. And my highest and only good added, my daughter, my will contains the creative power. Therefore, it creates in the soul the strength, the grace, the light and the very beauty with which it wants its own things to be done by the soul. So the soul feels a divine strength within herself, as if it were her own, a grace which is sufficient for the good that she must do, or for a pain that she's given to suffer, a light which, as though naturally, makes her see the good that she does. And, attracted by the beauty of the divine work that she performs, she rejoices and makes feast, because the works that my will performs in the soul carry the mark of joy and of a perennial feast. This feast was started by my fiat in creation, but it was interrupted by the split of the human will from that of God. And as the soul lets the supreme will operate and dominate, the feast resumes its course and the amusements, the games, the delights continue between the creature and us. There is no unhappiness or sorrow within us. How could we give it to creatures? And if they feel unhappiness, it is because they leave the divine will and enclose themselves within the little field of the human will. Therefore, as they return to the supreme volition, they find the joys, the happiness, the power and the strength, the light, the beauty of their creator. And making them their own, they feel within themselves a natural divine substance, which reaches the point of giving them joy and happiness, even in sorrow. Therefore, it is always a feast between the soul and us. We play 
and we delight together. Might be good to remember. Right size. Then my poor mind continued to think about the difference that exists between one who lets herself be dominated by the supreme will and one who lets herself be dominated by the human will. And my highest and only good added, my daughter, my will contains the creative power. Therefore, it creates in the soul the strength, the grace, the light, and the very beauty with which it wants its own things to be done by the soul. So, the soul feels a divine strength within herself, as if it were her own. A grace which is sufficient for the good that she must do, or for a pain that she is given to suffer. A light which, as though naturally, makes her see the good that she does. And attracted by the beauty of the divine work that she performs, she rejoices and makes feast because the works that my will performs in the soul carry the mark of joy and of a perennial feast. This feast was started by my fiat in creation, but it was interrupted by the split of the human will from that of God. And as the soul lets the supreme will operate and dominate, the feast resumes its course and the amusements, the games, the delights continue between the creature and us. There is no unhappiness or sorrow within us. How could we give it to creatures? And if they feel unhappiness, it is because they leave the divine will and enclose themselves within the little field of the human will. Therefore, as they return to the supreme volition, they find the joys, the happiness, the power, the strength, the light, the beauty of their creator. And making them their own, they feel within themselves a natural divine substance, which reaches the point of giving them joy and happiness, even in sorrow. Therefore, it is always a feast between the soul and us. We play and we delight together. Oh, James, can we stop at that point? We stop. We've stopped, darling. Oh, okay. So you see that sentence there where it says, we, we feel happiness even in sorrow. Mm. Remember last Tuesday, John from the Philippines was kind of trying to ask to me, uh, asking me, but how can we feel, you know, all this joy, continuous joy, when, you know, we see all around us on the earth these horrendous, you know, sorrowful, situations and he was feeling that sorrow you know for what's happening in the philippines so he was asking me how is it possible that we can live in continual happiness and joy i don't know if you remember but i was trying to explain to him this particular truth here that if you're truly living in the divine will you sorrow in the unique way of the sorrows of Jesus and Mary in particular. You, you enter, you, you living, their humanity is living in you. And in you, you experience their sorrow without losing the celestial joy of living in the divine will. Wow. they can no longer <clears throat> sorrow in heaven that's why they love us so much because we're giving them our humanity in which to suffer and to sorrow but we never lose for a moment the joy of living in the divine will even though we're experiencing their sufferings and their sorrows 
I make it, I make a specific case of saying their sufferings and their sorrows. Not our own. Not not our own. We don't our subjective sufferings and sorrows that we used to um, live in <clears throat> are now transformed into divine sorrows and sufferings. So there's nothing of our self left. <clears throat> That's beautifully explained. Is that what, is, is that what I, I, am I sort of making it clear when you meet people that, um, and I do continuously, that think they're living in the divine will, but they're constantly um, bemoaning this or that terrible thing happening or that situation, um, and it's affecting them physically, you can see it. Mm. But there is a difference between... The way we experience suffering and sorrow in our humanity and the way we suffer it when we're living in the humanities of Jesus and Mary. Thank you, Geraldine. That's beautiful. Okay. I'm just I'm just repeating what Jesus says here, uh, but I'm trying to explain it because. It seems to be a problem with people because they misinterpret, like John was saying, well, how can we feel this joy all the time when there's so much terrible evil around us? And that's a very good question, of course, uh, but it's very hard to explain unless you are have experienced living in the divine will and the divine the sorrows of the divine will. Thank you, Geraldine, from down here. And uh, uh, just correct, I re rephrase it this way. Uh, even the sorrows, the human sorrows and the divine sorrows that we try to be uh, uh, live with and in the divine will. They form part of the game and the delight of creator and creature. This even surrendering our sorrows to him and he sorrowing with us. Like it's a game that as he says here, it's always a feast because there is joy and happiness even in sorrow. And we play and we delight together. Like it's part of the game. Uh, with our creator. Is that, uh, am I saying it right, Geraldine? I, I understand, John, what you're saying. It's very beautiful. Um, when I speak about human sorrow, I don't mean that the human sorrow is irrelevant, you know, to our life. Uh, you're trying, you're, you're explaining it much better than I am, John. But when we fuse our human sorrow into the divine sorrow, it takes on a different character. It, it, it's, it's mingled with the delight and the joy of sorrowing within the humanity of Jesus. Am I, am I saying that correctly, John? Yes, I guess so. You, as you were saying that, uh, Geraldine, I remember there's a practice I do sometimes when I'm so loaded down with all of that, you know, it just surrounds you. And then I voluntarily uh, make it a point to say, I pray the rosary now and I would like to meditate on the glorious mysteries, especially the resurrection, because there he shows me that he has conquered and so it, it works for me because I don't want to be wallowing in sorrow, but I remind myself that Jesus is victorious. And then in yesterday's feast, that Mary is victorious is in feast. And so that lifts me up, really, really lifts me up. That's a wonderful, um, 
that's a wonderful thing you're doing, John, because, um, for example, I do something similar. If I'm watching the movie, The Passion of the Christ, um, to enter more deeply into the visual witness of the sufferings of Jesus, my poor limited humanity can't contain the depth of the sorrow that Our Lady entered in sharing with Jesus his passion. So I, I can only watch it to a certain point. And then like you, I have to, uh, I have to pause and because my humanity still hasn't expanded to that extent of our blessed mothers. And I pause and I stop watching the horrendous martyrdom of Jesus. And I go into another prayer to strengthen me, like you're doing, John. And, and uh, going towards another mystery or another round. And then I come back to the sorrow, sorrowful passion of our Lord, because we are, you know, even when we're fusing ourselves into the divine will, as I explained uh, on another lesson, our womb is it expands like a woman's womb expands to contain the growing child. So the womb of our will fused into the divine is expanding more and more so that we can absorb more of the sorrows, more of the sufferings of Jesus. So, for example, if you see a victim soul like um, Alexandrina, for example, if you've seen photos of her, she's smiling, like, you know, she's suffering uh, intense pains, uh, and yet there's this joy on her face. It merges together the two... When Jesus is doing the suffering and the sorrowing in you, um, you're able to do it because he's doing it in you. But like you say, you're fusing your human responses to the, the evils that you're witnessing around you. But you might, if you didn't fuse it into him, you would find it unbearable, you know, to... Okay. to uh, to deal with the evils that are now expanding, you know, throughout the world. But I think, John, you put it so beautifully. Would you like to just finish with something more, John, because I think you put it so beautifully, what you do. Thank you, Geraldine. It's okay. Uh, uh, you beautifully got for me, and I'm happy that you you shared also how you, for example, Nena and I are now in the 20th 20. hour of the passion. And so we really have to pause once in a while and then really to be aware of who is suffering for us. It's not us bearing all this, but he has. And he, and so it points already to, to the resurrection as we hear in the scriptures. And he, for the joy that he, he knows that the victory is coming, we remind ourselves constantly of that. And so I'm very grateful, really, for the mysteries of the simple prayer, the rosary, that it covers all. I mean, it's a game. We know that there is the, the, the sorrowful, but we know that there is the, the glorious mysteries as the feast also of yesterday. It looks really beautiful. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for asking the difficult questions. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Geraldine. If you'd like to take it up. Um, James, thank you, sweetheart. On the other hand, in the human will, there is not a creative power which, if one wants to exercise the virtues, might be able to create patience, humility, obedience, etc. This is why one feels hardship and fatigue in order to be able to practice the virtues, 
because the divine strength that sustains them, the creative power that nourishes them and gives them life is missing. And so inconstancy appears and one passes easily from virtues to vices, from prayer to dissipation, from church to amusements, from patience to impatience. All this mix of good and evil produces unhappiness in the creature. On the one hand, one who lets my will reign within herself feels firmness in good. She feels that all things bring her happiness and joy. More so, since all the things created by us carry the mark, the seed of the joy and the happiness of the one who created them. And they were created by us so that all of them might bring happiness to man. Each do you think we should stop there and um okay. and and discuss Again. that yeah that that's the answer to our former question yeah <laughs> that's what i thought <laughs> do you see how um i have this habit of saying there are no questions in the divine will because jesus always answers them almost immediately you know he knows what's in our heart he knows what these questions are and these questions were in Louisa in the beginning you know she carried all the questions that we will ever want to know and ask Jesus so there it is um James thank you for reading that so he says there when we're living these sorrows and hardships and only in the exercise of the virtues, right? That, that means we're living them in a, a good way. We're trying to live them, you know, in, in the virtues, but without the strength and the perfection and the joy and the, um, of the divine volition. So that's why we... Um, have pauses like he says go from church out to our entertainment you know because our humanity does not have the capacity to embrace the depth of sorrow that existed within the humanity of Jesus so only this divine strength that we get from fusing our acts into the divine will so, for example, if we're in mass and we say, Jesus, I want to live every act of your passion from your conception to your, your holy death, I want to participate in it, but I can't do it in my humanity. I can't even do it if in the virtues I need to fuse myself into the infinite capacity of your will. Uh, in order to share with you these sufferings, these sorrows. If once we pray that prayer, or, you know, in our own words, we pray it in a different way. After Mass, we can't even move. We want to remain. We want to remain with Jesus. Uh, we can't just get up and say, um, well, where do you want to go and have coffee now? Like, you know, this is a normal thing Catholics do. We have just witnessed the most incredible act of our divine saviour and not just Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, all are participating. At the consecration, Jesus tells Louisa, the Father and the Holy Spirit descend they're all truly present. And then they give themselves to you and they want a return of gratitude and joyful gratitude for God has just emptied himself to pour himself into you. Mm. And you want to go and have a cup of coffee? Right, please, honestly. You know, um, don't you want to remain with him uh, 
St. Teresa of Avila said, at least 20 minutes after communion to give thanks to God. These, she said these are the most important, you know, important moment of your life. This is the nuptial embrace of God to your soul. But now we know we can continue that nuptial embrace by living in the divine will. So then our Lord gives us the signs here that we're not living in him because we can move from church to amusements, from virtues to vices, from prayer to dissipation, from patience to impatience. All of this mixes good and evil, produces unhappiness in the creature. So if you meet a soul that is unhappy, even though they say they're living, they're going to a divine will, cynical or that, it's a sign that they're still living in the unhappy state of their human will. And they're trying to live the virtues. They're, uh, well, I, I know people like this, they're, they're making a lot of effort to, li uh, to live a virtuous life and they are living a virtuous life. But because they're not fusing themselves continually into the divine will, they're allowing the, hum the human will to dominate. Thank you, Gerald. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, sorry. I never know when to stop, Jenny. I'm oh, sorry. Beautiful. Keep going. It's all beautiful. But, but Jesus speaks it so clearly. And yet I find it strange that people don't understand what he's saying. Yes, beautiful. Do you want to do Go the, ahead, Jane. Do you want to do the next one, darling? Each created thing has the mandate from us to bring to the creature the happiness and the joy it possesses. In fact, what joy and happiness does the light of the sun not bring? What pleasure do the blue heavens, a flowery field, a murmuring sea not bring to one's sight? What enjoyment do a sweet and tasty fruit, some very fresh water and many, many other things not bring to one's palate? All created things say to man in their mute language, we bring you the happiness and the joy of our creator. But do you want to know in whom all things, all created things find the echo of their joy and happiness? In one in whom they find my will reigning and dominating. Because that will which reigns in them as whole, that which God himself possesses, and that which reigns in the soul, become one and make seas of joy, of happiness, and of contentment overflow into one another. Indeed, it is a true feast. Therefore, my daughter, every time you fuse yourself in my will, and you go around through all created things to impress your love, your glory, your adoration upon each thing I created to make you happy, I feel joy happiness and glory being renewed in me as in the act in which we issued the whole creation. I'll read that again. Yes, Each created thing has the mandate from us to bring to the creature the happiness and the joy it possesses. In fact, what joy and happiness does the light of the sun not bring? What pleasure do the blue heavens, a flowery field, a murmuring sea not bring to one's sight? What enjoyment do a sweet and tasty fruit or some very fresh water and many, many other things not bring to one's palate? All created things say to man in their new language, we bring you the happiness and the joy of our creator. But do you want to know in whom all created things find the echo of their joy and happiness? In one in whom they find my will reigning and dominating. 
Because that will which reigns in them as whole, that which God himself possesses, and that which reigns in the soul become one and make seas of joys, of happiness, and of contentment overflow into one another. Wow. Indeed, it is a true feast. The nuptials are beautiful. Therefore, my daughter, every time you fuse yourself in my will, you go and you go around to all created things to impress your love and your glory, your adoration upon each thing I created to make you happy. I feel joy, happiness and glory being renewed in me as in the act in which we issued the whole creation. Truly beautiful, sublime. Anything to say, Dr. Wow. It's wow, isn't it? Wow, wow, wow. <clears throat> um, w O W, I've got in, in my study um, version of the 36 volumes, I write a lot of wows. Uh, on the in the column and one day I was putting well well and then I thought what do those letters mean and and uh, I felt they meant wonder of wonders love it wonder <laughs> <of> wonders. <laughs> so how could we not be happy even when I'm I feel like physically I'm falling apart and I've got one foot in the grave. I'm so happy. I couldn't care less if I just dissolved into my father's will and I gave my last breath into his in his arms and my last word would be fiat. I fuse myself, Father, into your will. That's what fiat means. I fuse myself, Father, into your will for all eternity. How could we not be happy? You know, like St. Lawrence, whose feast day was last week, I think, and he's being um, burned on the stake and he says, turn me over, I'm done on this side. It's sort of like that. <laughs> right, thank you, Lord. And when, when St. Stephen's being stoned to death and he's looking at heaven and smiling and saying, I see the glory of God before me, you know. <laughs> like when we read the stories of the martyrs and the saints, we understand, even though the physical pain, of course they feel it, but who's to, who's to know? Who's to know? There's a story St. Joan of Arc burnt at the stake God, she was terrified of fire, you know. Who's to know that God didn't spare her some of that pain because of her great love for him? And in the end, um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently uh, everything else was burned, but her heart remained. As, as si a symbol, you see, of her great love for the will of God in her, for which she was persecuted by the church, you know, the hierarchy I'm talking about. So um, this is the joy of martyrdom. This is where joy overcomes our sufferings and our sorrows. But in the divine will, it's extraordinary multiplication of joy that brings joy to the Trinity themselves, as it says here, this joy, happiness and glory that Jesus feels being renewed in himself. Where else do we want to be? What else do we want to do? We're giving joy, glory and happiness to our beloved, our beloved. Sorry, I'm just repeating what he's saying. Now that I keep telling people, Jenny, that there's no questions in the divine will, have you noticed everyone does? <laughs> Nobody's asking questions anymore. <laughs> we have got a question which we will answer later. 
Um, but what we will do is we'll just finish the paper because there's only one more paragraph, if that's okay by everybody. And then we'll answer yeah. some of those other questions. So thank you, Jack. Yeah. Thank you. You cannot understand the feast you make for us when we see your littleness, which, wanting to embrace everything in our will, repays us in love and in glory for all created things. Our joy is so great that we put everything aside to enjoy the joy and the feast that you give us. Therefore, to live in the supreme will is the greatest thing for us and for the soul. It is the outpouring of the creator over the creature. And pouring himself over her, he gives her his shape and makes her share in all the divine qualities in such a way that we feel our works, our joy, our happiness being repeated by her. I'll read that again. Yes. You cannot understand the feast you make for us when we see your littleness, which, wanting to embrace everything in our will, repays us in love and in glory for all created things. Our joy is so great we put everything aside to enjoy the joy and the feast that you give us. Therefore, to live in the supreme will is the greatest thing for us and for the soul. It is the outpouring of the creator over the creature. And pouring himself over her, he gives her shape and makes her share in all the divine qualities in such a way that we feel our works, our joy, and our happiness being repeated by her. Thank you, Chance. That's beautifully read. Mm. Any highlight again? Okay. And I go. It's different on this because it's in the PDF. This is a Word document. I couldn't help but highlight that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But this is the, the great and profound repetition that's repeated through the 36 volumes. It's we're giving the greatest happiness to the Trinity themselves. In, in this simple act, like he says up there, in our littleness, in our littleness, we have a capacity to give the greatest happiness to the Trinity that they've ever experienced since the creation of Adam and the whole creation. And if you look at a tiny little newborn baby, you know, when that baby's newborn, doesn't that little baby give the greatest happiness to that family? Yeah. Everyone crowds around it, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles, the godparents, the siblings, the mother and the father. They're all adoring this little newborn. And that's what happens with the Trinity, where little newborns in the divine will and the whole of heaven crowds around us with smiles and is rejoicing that this little newborn, that's you, is smiling at the Trinity and fusing your tiny little acts into the great and wondrous, universal, magnificent, infinite, perfect, pure and lovely act of your eternal father and mother. This is the greatest thing you can do. And to think we can do it, not just once a day, but as many times as we think of it, we can do it all day. Awesome. And, and I just want to add to that, in this one single hour we're spending reading these um, letters and words of light, Jesus said he wrote these words of light with his own finger of light mm -hmm. in the soul of Louisa. 
<clears throat> he wrote on her soul what her soul was the blank parchment upon which he wrote the celestial doctrine. So when we're reading these words of light, we're reading them as they were written on Louisa's soul. And because we're reading them in the divine will, because we fused our will into the divine will in our prayer, we are creating divine life for every word we're reading. So after each session that we are doing and studying and imbibing and masticating these truths, we are creating between us all innumerable divine lives that will exist for all eternity because we are pronouncing these words of light with the voice of light of our, of our divine eternal word, Jesus. So every time we speak, it's Jesus speaking, using our voice as his organ. And when we're speaking, we are creating, because the eternal word never speaks without creating what he speaks. He says that. Everything I say to you in the in this celestial doctrine, I am manifesting in your soul. You might not know it. As I've said before, a woman at the point of conception, she might not know she's pregnant at that point, but she is pregnant. And are you 2% pregnant, 10% pregnant, 50% pregnant? No, you're always pregnant, full, even though the divine will is only at its initial stages of growing in you. You're always pregnant with the divine will. You're full of the divine will. Okay. And then as you practice your rounds and your acts of fusion, you expand your capacity to uh, be pregnant to the full with the divine will. So the, this constant fusion, these constant rounds of love, continual I love you, I love you, Jesus, in the rays of the sun. I love you, Jesus, as I rise out of my bed in the morning. I love you, Jesus, in my breath. I want to tell you all day, Jesus, in my breathing in, I love you. In my breathing out, I want to breathe out my I love you upon all creation. You see, it's a constant. When you're in love, you, you can't stop it. You know, it's a, I love you, I love you. You're in love. So don't worry if you don't understand what that love is doing. Some people get caught up, you know, in trying to understand it. When you're in love, you don't really understand what's going on. You're just in love, you know, and you're, you just want to be with your beloved. Oh, that's beautifully put, um, Geraldine. Thank you. I've got a question um, to ask. Can I, I say something real quick? Yep. Jenny? Yeah. Hi, Geraldine. This is Steve from, from California. Um, Hello, Steve. Yes. Good to see you again. Um, so I was thinking so much on the emphasis, so beautiful that you were talking about staying in the continuous act of fusing, fusing, and that beauty and that power from that. And so I was thinking back to when you were thinking of the word wow and wonder of wonders and so then I was just thinking of this terms of fusion and our word fiat, fiat. And I thought, fusing in him another time. Oh, <laughs> every wonderful. time we say fiat, every time we say fiat, I'm fusing in him another time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Fusing yeah. in him another time no. like that. Yeah, but thank you. That's very good. That's wonderful, Steve. Thanks for that. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, 
Geraldine, we've got a question. It said, uh, dear Geraldine, could you please repeat again the difference of suffering in and out the divine will? Can you repeat that question, Jenny? Yes. Uh, could you uh, please repeat again the difference of suffering in the divine will and out of the divine will? The difference of suffering in the divine will and out of the divine will. Yes, please. Oh, well, <laughs> there's a world of difference. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when we suffer without fusing in the divine will, we're suffering in the limited, the limited capacity of our humanity. Therefore, this is why things overwhelm us you know um i'll tell you something now because i've had a as we all have had a previous existence you know before we came into the divine will so i've suffered uh four breakdowns mental breakdowns uh even though i was living my catholic life the sacramental life, daily mass, uh, rosary, spiritual reading. And um, God permitted it, of course. It was permitted for a reason, and I won't go into why that happened um, because then I'd have to go into details that are not necessary. Now, in the first breakdown, it wasn't depression, by the way. It was a massive uh, breakdown. I was catatonic and uh, unable to function. I had an experience of God, but at the same time, that experience was um, pivotal, you know, in my inner transformation. And I never forgot that experience of God, his love. And that began my true journey into God. But I wasn't aware of the divine will then, but I wanted to know the inner life of the Holy Family. So I saw in a magazine advertise the city of God by Mary of Agreda. And I sent to America for the four volumes and I began to read it. And that was the beginning of my um, new life, transformative life. But I'm still living, trying to live the sorrows and sufferings of my personal life in my human will in a virtuous way. So in the sanctity of the virtues, right? But while you're living your sufferings and sorrows, and they were great, um, in your humanity, your humanity doesn't have always the capacity, you know, to embrace great suffering. Mine didn't, obviously, and therefore I, I collapsed completely. So, but if you suffer in the divine will, you have an extraordinary capacity to deal with suffering because Jesus is suffering in you. Your limited capacity in your humanity no longer exists. Jesus is suffering in you. You still feel the pain. He doesn't take away the suffering from you. He gives you his own self to carry you, you know, to, have, to carry that cross in you. And you, because you've fused yourself, you're doing it consciously. Like it's not an unconscious thing. Like when I was suffering prior to coming into the divine will, I wasn't fully conscious that it, Jesus was helping me. He was like the invisible, you know, helper. But in the divine will, everything is a conscious 
act. And you're constantly giving glory to God for everything, every breath. It's so different. It doesn't take away the pain. See, some people think, um, oh, it'll be great living in the divine world because I won't have to have any more sufferings and sorrows and that. Most of the, our sufferings and sorrows in our hu human will are because we have wrongful thinking. We are not thinking with the mind of the Holy Spirit. That's why we fuse constantly our intellect, our memory and our will into the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Because if we keep thinking in a human way, we will keep blaming others for the conditions that we live in. We'll point the finger at somebody else. What was the first thing Adam and Eve said when they hid in the garden from God? Adam said, she made me do it, right? It was her, she fell in, you know, she fell first and then she enticed me. That's the beginning of blame and shame. The human will blames and shames the other person because we don't want to take the full responsibility. And, and guess what Eve said? The devil made me do it. Now, Adam said Eve made me do it, and Eve said the devil made me do it. And um, then they, the consequences were they could not live in the terrestrial paradise of the divine will anymore, where they were totally happy. So if you find yourself blaming someone else for your situation or shaming someone else, you're living in your human will. Is that okay as an answer? That's fantastic. Beautiful, Geraldine. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I've just realised now it's six past six. We've had our hour. It's been glorious and blessed. And would you like to close with the prayer, please, Geraldine? I do love the way you pray. Jesus prays in you. I love it. We fuse ourselves into you. Eternal Father, we love you. Jesus, eternal wisdom, we love you. Holy Spirit, eternal love, we love you. We give thanks for all that you've done in us today in this precious hour of studying the celestial doctrine. And even though we don't fully grasp or understand it with our limited intelligence, we know that you have fused as much into us as is possible today. And we all give thanks. And we say, fiat mihi, may it be done unto me according to thy will. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you so much, everyone. We've finished the additional bit that um, Geraldine gave us um, because I love the way Geraldine tweaks all the time. So we'll go back into that book, continuing it next week, everybody. We'll pick up where we left off because Geraldine said, oh, we stop there and we'll add this paper, which we've just finished. So thank you, Geraldine, for the constant way you tweak things or add things or change things. I think it's fantastic. And God love you and God bless you. And God love and God bless you all. I love you with the love of the Lord. Love you in the will of God. Amen. God bless everyone. Amen. Amen.